friends, and welcome to this week's episode. Today, I'm going to talk in detail about specifically perimenopause, which is frankly the most difficult time period in the whole hormonal spectrum to manage as a patient and as a provider because it's characterized by a roller coaster of up and down hormones that can create a whole bunch of different unpleasant symptoms. So instead of talking about menopause and hormone replacement that we focused on quite a bit, let's talk about just this specific period of time called perimenopause. So let me start by defining it. Well, backing up, when we were 12 or so, we started making estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone from our ovaries when we started having periods and went through puberty. And each one of those hormones fluctuated in different ways. So estradiol, for example, is lowest during our menstrual period. It's always present, but it's lowest during our cycle. It goes up towards ovulation. And remember, this is when we're young and fertile, and we're just gonna pretend that everybody has perfect 28-day cycles. I realize that's not always the case. But about two weeks after our period starts, and in gynecologic terms, we call that day 14 of our cycle, day one being the first day of bleeding. So up goes the estrogen. Around day 14, we release an egg. Our estrogen is very high. And then if we don't get pregnant, the estrogen drops again and we have another period. So estradiol is consistently going up and down, generally in a pretty manageable manner. And so that's great. And then progesterone is zero or close to it during our cycle. And then after ovulation, it jumps up. The part of the ovary that releases the egg produces progesterone. Remember, it's progestational. That means it's designed to protect the little embryo if we have one. And then if we don't get pregnant, that drops too. And we have another period. So both of those hormones are going up and down, you know, every 28 to 30 days. Granted, it's not always perfect, but that was what was happening when we were young and fertile. And then at some point in the future, at an average age of 50 or 51, we stop releasing eggs. And so there's no more progesterone because we only produce that after ovulation. And there's no more estradiol because we're not making any estrogen from our ovaries. So those two go to zero or very close to it. Sometimes we do produce a little bit of estradiol in our peripheral tissue like body fat, but essentially our ovaries are producing neither one of those hormones when we're postmenopausal. And then just a little word on that third hormone, testosterone. It's pretty stable throughout the cycle. There's a little blip around ovulation where it goes up in order to we assume, improve our libido when we're fertile. But generally, it's fairly stable throughout the cycle. But over our lives, it's slowly decreasing starting at about age 30. Okay, so that's what's going on when we're young and fertile. And we also know what happens when we're menopausal and all of those hormones drop to zero or very close to it. Now, we might still produce a little bit of testosterone, but not very much. And then there's this in-between time that we call perimenopause. It's not a strict medical definition. It's more just an understanding that, okay, we're no longer producing hormones in that very organized manner, and we're still producing hormones, so we're not menopausal. So peri, meaning around the time of menopause, applies to that time when our hormones are starting to change, but we're still making them. So what are the characteristics of perimenopause? Well, we're still releasing estrogen, we're still ovulating, although probably not regularly. So what can happen is we start having periods that are less regular. We might skip some. They might ironically be closer together. So instead of every 28 days, they might be every 25 days or every 21 days because that ovulation is not occurring as regularly anymore. So we're still making lots of estrogen and we're making less progesterone because as our ovaries get older, when we release the egg, it's just not as strong anymore. We're not making those large amounts of progesterone. And so we often call this a time of estrogen dominance because you've got lots of estrogen and very little progesterone. So dominance meaning estrogen is dominant over progesterone, if that makes sense. So what happens when we're estrogen dominant? Well, we're making lots of estrogen and less progesterone. So the uterine lining loves estrogen. We grow lots of uterine lining and we don't have as much progesterone to counter that effect, which is one of the wonderful things that progesterone does. It helps our period to be lighter. So when we have estrogen dominance, we sometimes have heavier periods, 
Sometimes they can be really heavy. They can last longer. You can skip them all together or you can have them closer together. So it's characterized by just lack of consistency. You know, the characteristic of perimenopause is we don't really know what's gonna happen. It can be all over the place. And as a result, we can feel like we're all over the place as far as symptoms. Now, if you think about when we were younger and now estrogen was going up and down in a nice, generally pretty manageable manner, when we're perimenopausal, we can have really high highs. Ironically, the estrogen can get higher than it used to be and then really low lows. So ironically, within the very same month, we can experience symptoms of high estrogen like breast tenderness, water retention, bloating, gaining fat around the middle, moodiness, tearfulness, all of those type of symptoms that if you've been pregnant, they're kind of similar to what we might have in early pregnancy when estrogen shoots up very, very high. It's generally not considered as pleasant, let's just say. So those are high estrogen symptoms. And then after ovulation, instead of just a nice slow decrease, it's a very, very steep crash in estrogen taking us to the time of our cycle. And at that time, our estrogen can be so low that we actually experience low estrogen symptoms, even menopausal type symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, those can occur just right around those few days that our estrogen is very low. So a common experience, and I actually had this myself, is that patients will have hot flashes, night sweats for say three to five days, and then they go away. And when this happened to me, I actually wasn't having periods because I'd already had an endometrial ablation procedure done. And so it took me a while to figure out that those symptoms were happening approximately once a month or so because my estrogen would go up and then it would come down and I wasn't having a period because of the ablation, but my estrogen was so low that I'd have those symptoms. And some of you might've experienced those when we're breastfeeding, for example, that's a time when our estrogen's low, night sweats, all of that stuff, and then they'd go away. And so at first I thought, wow, I just went through menopause in three days. That was easy. Well, sure enough, I was wrong. It came back. And then I realized, gosh, this is happening about every 30 to 45 days or so. And that's what a lot of women experience. If you're having a period, you might notice that you're having those symptoms right around the time of your period. And then lo and behold, the symptoms go away. Two weeks later now, it's like, oh, my boobs hurt and I'm retaining water because now your estrogen is too high. So just to say that is not pleasant. And another thing that happens, not only are we having these, this roller coaster of estrogen, but that steep decline from ovulation where it's very high down to our period where it's very low, it's such a steep decline that if you are someone who, like me, experience premenstrual mood swings, for example, with that rapid hormone change the week before our cycle, it can get a lot worse because that drop is so precipitous. So instead of dropping from say, I'll just throw out some numbers and they're, they're kind of arbitrary, I know, but just say when you were young and fertile, your estradiol might be 300 when you're ovulating and 100 when you're on your period. It's a you know little drop. I've checked patients' estrogen when they're ovulating who are perimenopausal who have estrogen levels close to 1,000, like 800 or higher, extremely high, and then below 50, which is enough to cause hot flashes when they're on their period. So imagine going from 800 to 50 in two weeks. That's a very steep drop-off. And no wonder that causes some unpleasant symptoms because our brains, in fact, every cell in our body, but particularly our brains, breasts, pelvis are full of estrogen receptors. So if we take those hormone levels from very high to very low, sure enough, our brain is going to feel it. And that might show up in all kinds of ways like sleep disturbance, temperature sensitivity, mood swings, memory loss, brain fog, pretty much anything you can think of to do with your brain. I can tell you when that was happening to me, I seriously thought I might be developing bipolar disorder or some other psychiatric disorder because I have that on certain side of the family and that really doesn't often develop in our 40s. But this just to say, it seems more than could be possible just with perimenopause. The symptoms can be really severe. And in my case, they certainly were, where mood swings were quite 
out of character. I mean, I hear this from patients every day, but you just feel like you're a different person. Sometimes words would come out of my mouth and I would look around and wonder who said that and I'd realize it was me. It's like, oh, shoot. Things that we normally keep inside our head <laughs> tend to come out of our mouth. It can be very difficult for not only ourselves because nobody likes to behave that way and then it leads to cycles of shame and guilt and apologies. But our family members and friends don't like it either and nor do the attendants at the grocery store or the person waiting tables when you're in a grumpy mood. It really can affect a lot of people. So it's not a small thing. Coworkers, and you probably have some coworkers who are perimenopausal and maybe try to be a little bit compassionate if they're in that age group, usually between 40 and 50. So rapidly dropping hormones affects our brain, doesn't feel good. And then I was talking about estrogen in that respect, but progesterone drops too. Now let's talk a little bit about that because I already mentioned progesterone does not go up as much when we're perimenopausal. You know, because the ovaries are getting older, they're not as fertile anymore. In fact, when we're perimenopausal, we're generally not fertile anymore, although there are exceptions to that. Generally, perimenopausal patients, even though they still are releasing eggs, those eggs are older, they're not generally fertilizable, and they produce very little progesterone. So if fertilization did occur, there's no hormone to support that little embryo. And so very unlikely that uh, healthy pregnancies ensue during that time. And that's why even though we might start being in perimenopause at say 42 and not go through menopause until 50, we can literally have eight years or more where we're releasing eggs, but we're not fertile because the eggs are not fertilizable. Now don't take that to the bank because occasionally someone does accidentally get pregnant, but generally the eggs are not fertilizable. We're not making enough progesterone. And because of that, this little blip in progesterone causes our cycle to be heavier. We already talked about that. But as that progesterone declines, that adds to these symptoms that we're having. So we've got a sharp drop in estrogen, drop in progesterone. Finally, when we have a period, generally we start feeling a little bit better. And then off it goes again, up to being too high. So characterized by these very unpredictable highs and lows. So one thing many patients notice is that they start skipping periods. So you might go two or three months without a period. That would be because you don't ovulate. Remember, periods are caused by ovulation. So about two weeks after we ovulate, we have a period. So if we don't ovulate, if we don't release an egg, we're not gonna have a period. At least we're not gonna have a period that's related to ovulation. So we'll go months, sometimes without one. Eventually we'll start bleeding because so much lining just builds up in the uterus that it sheds, but it's not due to progesterone dropping because remember we didn't make any progesterone if we didn't ovulate. So all of it can get pretty darn complicated and uncomfortable. So sometimes we'll go months without a period. Maybe we think we're done. We're like, okay, that's it. I'm menopausal and then Sure enough, we'll have another period. And that's one of the reasons why an old uh, expression was that we're not menopausal until we have not had a period for a year. That's one of the ways that menopause is defined. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be treated if you're symptomatic during that year. We're not going to say, oh, you have to wait a year before we can help you. It's just uh, speaking to the fact that you can literally go months without a period six, eight, nine months, and then all of a sudden have another one. Maybe the ovary just decided to ovulate one last time. A year's a made up number, but the idea being that if you've gone a really long time without a period, it's very unlikely that you'll have another one. So somebody made that number up a year, just sounded like a nice round number, but suffice to say, if you go a really long time without a period, chances are you probably won't have another one, but it's very common to go a month or two or three without one. It's unpredictable. And so that's a pain, right? Like we don't know when our period's gonna be and that's certainly socially awkward and difficult. And then when it does happen, it's really heavy. So I remember before I had my endometrial ablation, I would just be talking to a patient and all of a sudden be sitting in a puddle of blood with no warning whatsoever. It was just like being in middle school. I mean, really annoying. And my laundry room was in all kinds of states of underwear being bleached and cleaned and it just was, a big mess and many of you understand that it's just unpleasant to say the least. 
So lots and lots of changes in our period. Now, just a couple of other ideas about what we can do to manage this heavy bleeding, if that's something that's bothering you. So heavy bleeding is miserable. Birth control pills, I already mentioned, can be really helpful to control bleeding. But if we're someone that doesn't want to or cannot take birth control pills, the Mirena, I-U-D, M-I-R-E-N-A, or Kylena, K-Y-L-E-N-N-A, are both really good options. Now, people sometimes get scared of these IUDs because they have hormones in them, and that's kind of a bad word. <laughs> but these are intrauterine devices. They're designed for birth control, but we're not using them for birth control in this setting. They're placed inside the uterus. It's a tiny bit uncomfortable to have an IUD placed. I've had one myself. The Mirena is a little bit bigger, so possibly a little bit more uncomfortable to place. But for patients who've had a vaginal delivery, I mean, it takes about 10 seconds to put an IUD and it's really easy. If you haven't had a vaginal delivery, the Kylena is a little bit smaller. Mirena lasts five years, Kylena lasts three years, either one are fine. So what happens is that IUD has a little bit of progestin, that synthetic progesterone-like hormone that I mentioned in it, and that thins out the uterine lining. So it's absolutely fine, even though, as you know, I love bioidentical hormones in this particular setting, that progestin is fantastic for cutting bleeding down. And many patients after three to six months have no bleeding at all, which is amazing. So you still have the hormonal swings. It is not touching that at all, but if we can get rid of any of the symptoms, isn't that great? So I had a professor who always said, just kill one rat at a time. And I do sometimes think about that. If we can make the bleeding go away, check that box, then we can work on the hormonal symptoms. So an IUD is a great idea. If for some reason you don't want to get an IUD, or in my case, I had a weird uterine anomaly that made it not safe for me to have an IUD, I had what's called an endometrial ablation procedure that I mentioned, and that is a fantastic thing. I think everybody should line up when they're 40 years old or when they're done having kids and have one of these done. <laughs> It's a very minor outpatient procedure with some IV sedation, so you can't feel anything. A little device is put inside the uterine cavity about the size of a pencil through the cervix, so no incision on your tummy. And then depending on the system, and there are several brands of, of this uh, type of system that are out there, either heat or sometimes uh, cold is used to destroy the uterine lining. Now, if we're using one of the heat methods, which is most typical, it burns that uterine lining down to the base. So fingers crossed, it never comes back. And in my case, I had it done when I was 42, never had a spot of bleeding after that again. It was amazing. And I went to work the next day. Generally, we recommend taking a day or so off work because you can have some pretty good cramps, but the kind that would be the taken care of with ibuprofen. So uterine cramping and then some discharge as that lining comes out is common for a week or two. And that's it. And then hopefully either no more bleeding or very light bleeding. So for most patients who have an ablation, often we say 50% of patients have no bleeding at all. The other 50% have much lighter periods. So something like that. Suffice to say, there's a really good chance it will make it a whole lot better. Now, remember, it just gets rid of the lining. This, this device is not getting into the whole uterus. So if you have a different type of pathology, like uterine fibroids, for example, which are extremely common, especially during this time of life, the ablation is probably not going to be successful. At least it's not going to be as successful because fibroids are actually in the muscle wall of the uterus, and those are not going to be removed with an endometrial ablation. Now, if you've got a tiny fibroid right in the center of the uterus, the ablation will take care of that. But if you've got uterine fibroids, they love estrogen. So again, going back to this estrogen dominance idea, we see very rapid growth of fibroids during perimenopause because they love estrogen. And so that's another reason why we can get heavier periods. So in that case, even though that's not my first choice, sometimes a hysterectomy, taking the uterus out and leaving the ovaries is the best choice. So talk to your gynecologist about those options. If you did have a hysterectomy, in almost all cases now, with very few exceptions, it can be done laparoscopically, just with belly button incision, depending on how it's done, might be just that one incision. Some other doctors do it with a couple of small incisions at the bottom, 24 hours or less in the hospital, and you're done. And we would not take out your ovaries unless there's a really good reason to do so, which there should be very few of those when we're in our 40s. But then there's no more bleeding. So 
If you have a hysterectomy and keep your ovaries, of course, your hormones are continuing to swing, but you're just not bleeding anymore. So those are some considerations. And then if you're really not wanting to have a hysterectomy, there's some non-surgical ways to shrink fibroids if you have them. Uh, lots of those out there now, they can be uh, ultrasound with MRI guidance that destroys the fibroids without an incision. Another way is to destroy the blood vessel that supplies the uterus. That's called a uterine fibroid embolization. Just to say there's lots of ways to deal with the bleeding aspect of perimenopause because we do not want to put up with that. Not only is it really inconvenient, but we can get sick. I have lots of patients come in who are really anemic. They've lost so much blood, sometimes need to even get a blood transfusion or their ferritin, their iron store is so low that they have to get IV iron infusions to build it back up again. So it's not a small thing. I mean, heavy bleeding can be inconvenient, but it can also make us really sick. So first step, let's get the bleeding under control and then we can deal with those hormonal issues. Other things that many patients notice just because of these really rapid hormone changes up and down, you know, really steep fluctuations, uh, not only mood swings, but other symptoms like joint pain, fatigue, I talked about memory loss, brain fog, all of those things are incredibly common because all of the cells in our body have hormone receptors. And so some of the symptoms can seem unrelated to our cycle, but if they happen right around the time of perimenopause, chances are at least a good part of them have something to do with our hormones. So those symptoms are very, very common. And what I find in my patient population is often we don't talk about them because some of them can be very embarrassing and sometimes shameful, like losing our sex drive, for example. That's another really common one. Now, there's a lot of reasons for losing sex drive, and it would not be correct to say that taking testosterone cures libido issues for women all the time, but it certainly does help for many or most women. In fact, every study that's been done on testosterone replacement for menopausal women has shown that testosterone works better than placebo, so it works it does work for most patients to improve libido. So loss of sex drive on those low estrogen days, sometimes vaginal dryness can start to set in as well as pain within a course. All of those things, you know, combine that with insomnia, gaining weight around the middle because we've talked before about how our metabolism changes in ways that favors fat storage. So we're gaining weight, we're not sleeping well, we're having all kinds of mood changes because of these ups and downs in hormones. So for sure, we don't want to have sex. I just want to go to sleep. I also don't want to eat healthy food. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm grumpy and tired, I want to eat sugar and I want to drink wine. And neither one of those are going to help this weight loss that I'm desiring. But our bodies just want us to feel better. So the weight gain is partly hormonal and partly, in most cases, lifestyle related because we feel like crap. So all makes sense, right? It's almost like a fire that's feeding itself. We don't feel good. We don't sleep well. So we don't work out. We eat sugar and on it goes. It gets worse and worse and worse. And when we go to our doctor, about half the time or more, we might hear something like, well, this is just normal. It's just part of getting older. So just go to Weight Watchers and exercise <laughs> or something like that. Or you'll be given an antidepressant because this is all pretty depressing, right? that's not getting to the root of the problem. So what can we do about this? And there's certainly lots of things that we can do because if we're going to be in this state for five to 10 years, it's not acceptable to tell patients just to put up with it. I mean, on what planet would men put up with something like that for eight to 10 years? Of course they wouldn't. And luckily there are some really good ways to help get through this period of time. And then once we transition into being menopausal, of course, that plan changes. So here's what happens if you come in to see me. First of all, I do believe that checking hormones is really useful. Now, certainly we can talk to you and I could guess, you know, more or less what your hormone levels would be, but I'm frequently surprised by what I see. And we're not just checking those three hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. We're also checking thyroid, checking for insulin resistance, looking at your kidney and liver function, looking at your vitamin and nutritional status, lots of things that could affect your general overall health. So I, I do think it's important to do that, even though it often turns out the way we predict. 
I like the data too, and I find that patients like to see the data because it just confirms that you are not crazy. And I tell patients this every day, look, look at your hormone levels. You're not crazy. No wonder you feel the way you feel. And I think it's very validating to see that. So I do think that's worth doing. Now, a very important word about hormones. If your hormones are going up and down, obviously the day that you check the hormones is critical to take into account when you're evaluating the result. For example, if I check your hormones during your period, I would expect your estradiol is going to be low, low compared to what it is at other times of your cycle. Your progesterone is going to be zero or very close to it. And your testosterone is, again, not affected by the cycle, but it's going to be a lot lower than it was when you were younger. So we already know that's what to expect. And then we look at the labs in that context. Now, on the other hand, if we check your labs, say three weeks after your period started, remember that should be after ovulation if you are in fact ovulating, I'd expect your estrogen to be somewhere between the highest and the lowest that it is, kind of a mid-range number for you. And I would expect that you would have some progesterone present because we're assuming that you ovulated. Now, if you didn't ovulate, we wouldn't see any progesterone three weeks after your period. So just to say it's really critical if anyone checks your labs that they know where you are in the context of your menstrual cycle, assuming you're still having one. And it can be really tricky. For example, if you come in and you haven't had a period in 90 days, who knows when you last ovulated? We really don't. But just to say, if a doctor checks your hormones and then they make a statement about your hormone status based on that one day, that is missing a lot of really important information. And I've heard this so many times, it just really puts a bee in my bonnet. <laughs> For example, a patient who's having hot flashes once a month, goes to her doctor and has her estrogen checked, and it's high because it was checked at a time when it would be high, and she's told, oh, you're fine, your hot flashes cannot be anything to do with menopause or hormones, they must be in your head or just take this antidepressant. What they're not recognizing is that, yes, it might look high today, but two weeks ago it was really low. So make sure that you're helping to educate your physician if they do draw your blood, that checking hormones is very variable when you're perimenopausal. Now, when you're postmenopausal, like me, if I wasn't taking anything, my hormones would be exactly the same every day. They'd be zero. <laughs> so that's pretty easy to interpret. But interpreting labs in a perimenopausal woman takes some thought. So make sure you are seeing someone who knows how to put those pieces together. Another example, if I checked your hormones during your period, as we talked about in that previous example, and your progesterone was zero, I'm not going to tell you that there's something wrong with that and that your progesterone is abnormally low because it's supposed to be zero during your cycle. So we just have to keep that in perspective and make sure that we know exactly where you are when we draw your blood. Now, I don't tell patients to come in on any particular day to get their blood drawn because we're pretty good at being able to put the pieces together. But if you are seeing someone who might not be quite so experienced at doing that, a couple of good times to check hormones are either at the low point, like during your cycle, maybe day three to five of your period, and then we know that we're checking at that very low baseline, so we can put that into our thought process. Or check your hormones about three weeks after your period started because at that time we expect that you're going to have elevated progesterone. So just to say that those are two particular times that we have an expectation of what your hormones should look like. Should I put in quotation marks because that, you know, should meaning when you were fertile. But if you just check them at some random time and then the doctor doesn't ask you when your last period was, they're going to be missing some information. So that's really important. Now just about testosterone, and we mentioned that it's pretty stable throughout the month. Um, you can expect in your 40s, it's going to be a rel relatively low number. It's certainly going to be lower than it was when you were 25 or 30 years old. Mine was zero when I was 45. That's not always the case. Uh, but when testosterone gets significantly lower than it was when we felt optimal, sex drive I mentioned can go away. We can start losing muscle much more quickly. As a result, our metabolism goes down so we can start gaining fat. We feel less strong, we have less energy, so we don't work out, and then we lose more muscle. 
and on and on it goes. All right, so we kind of get the picture of what it feels like to be perimenopausal. So what can we do about it? Well, one easy way, which is offered to many patients, and it's a pretty good idea, to make all this go away temporarily is to take a low-dose birth control pill. So you all know that I'm a big proponent of bioidentical hormones, and birth control pills are not bioidentical hormones, and they are taken by mouth and all the things that we often talk about not doing when we're older. But for a short time when we're in our 40s, if we're otherwise healthy, if we don't smoke, if we haven't had a previous blood clot, if we don't have heart disease, we need to go through some health questions to make sure that birth control pills will be safe for you. But given that we pass through that, that questionnaire and you come through that with flying colors, taking a low dose birth control pill for a short time will completely get rid of those perimenopausal symptoms. And it's not something you're gonna stay on forever, it's just to buy some time. Because what happens when we're on birth control pills is it shuts down our own ovarian function. Basically, our ovaries go into hibernation. That's how it works for pregnancy prevention because we don't release eggs. And we're getting a little bit of estrogen and a little bit of a progestin, which is a substance that's kind of like progesterone every day in the form of the pill. And so that gets rid of all of those symptoms. Basically, your hormones are the same every day, which is lovely. I mean, if you're someone who's suffering from these really wild up and down roller coaster swings. Having your hormones the same every day for a little while to give you a break can just feel amazing. So that is not a bad idea. So just because I love non-aural bioidentical hormones does not mean that a low dose birth control pill is not a really good idea just for a short time. So what do I mean by a short time? I mean, just till you get to the end of perimenopause and then you won't need it anymore. So often we'll put patients on a low dose birth control pill and if you're feeling really good with that, you know, maybe 48 to 50, we'll stop them for a couple of weeks and check your hormones and see where you are because maybe you don't need them anymore. You may already be menopausal at that point and then we can shift over to something that's more appropriate to take long term. So low dose birth control pills are a really, really good idea, especially if you've got lots of those highs and lows. Now, let's just say you're someone who either doesn't want to take birth control pills or you should not take them because you've got an increased risk of blood clotting or some other reason why you haven't done well on them in the past. There's some other things that we can do as well. There's a product that I've talked about before called DIM, D-I-M. It's diendylmethane, which, which is actually extracted from broccoli. Now, as a traditionally trained doctor, I thought that sounded like a bunch of baloney, but it actually is true, and I have a video about it that you can look at from the past, that DIM actually has some scientifically proven effects that can be beneficial in this situation. So it does help our liver to clear the hormones more thoroughly. So it lowers those high peaks a little bit, and that can feel really good so that we don't get those really high highs. And it's a broccoli extract, so it's harmless. You can actually get it online. Uh, there's a product made by Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E, that I love. Everybody knows I love Thorne products. Um, 150 milligrams of DIM a day can really help with things like breast tenderness, water retention, all of those high estrogen symptoms. So that's an option. Another option is to take some progesterone because one of the major causes, if not the most important major cause of perimenopausal symptoms is this decrease in progesterone. So you can take progesterone to replace that that you're not making anymore. And there's a couple of ways you can do it. There's several ways you can do it. But if we're trying to simulate nature, which is one thought, we would start taking it about two weeks after our period, so around the time of ovulation, or when we used to ovulate, and you take it for two weeks. So you take it, say, from day 14 to 28, or something like that. There's lots of different recipes that doctors prefer, but that's one that I find quite easy. So you don't take it for two weeks, starting from your period, two weeks later, take progesterone for two weeks, and that fills in that little gap where you're still making some progesterone on your own, but not very much. And that can really help with mood swings, sleep, bloating, all of those nasties. And it's really safe and relatively easy to do. Now it's a little bit of a pain in the neck to be counting the days and all of that. But if you're someone who can take something for 14 days and not take it for 14 days, that's pretty straightforward. And remember progesterone makes you sleepy. You can take it by mouth. 
You can actually get it from any pharmacy. So it's plant-based, bioidentical progesterone, same exact stuff you've had in your body all your life up until now. So very, very safe. And then once you stop taking the progesterone, your blood levels drop and that simulates what happens in nature so that you'll have another period. So it can help to make your cycles more regular. It's kind of tricking your body into thinking that you ovulated when we take progesterone in that way. And it also can thin the uterine lining if you're someone who's having really heavy periods. So it's kind of a blessing that's quite easy. Makes your period lighter, generally makes it more regular, helps with mood swings, helps with sleep. So that's a great easy option. Now, some people get tired of counting and you can actually just take progesterone every day. Now, that's what I do and that's what I did when I was perimenopausal and, and that works very well for many people. So the argument is, well, we don't wanna take progesterone every day because in nature we only make it half of the time but it's actually fine to take it every day, especially if you suffer from insomnia or mood swings. An interesting thing about progesterone is it's not going to prevent ovulation. So if you're still releasing eggs, it won't make that stop, which is why it's not useful for birth control. So if you took progesterone every day, you'd be getting a baseline of progesterone from what you're taking in the pill. And then in the background, if you're ovulating, you're still gonna have a little blip of your own progesterone that drops, and so you'll still have a period. So there's an idea that if you take progesterone every day, it will mess up your cycles. Generally it doesn't, because you still ovulate and you still have a drop in progesterone from your own progesterone production, if that makes sense, even though you're taking the same dose every day in the form of the pill. So you can take it every day, which I personally find easier. Another thing about taking it every day is if it's helping with sleep, I don't want to just have two weeks out of the month when I sleep well. I want to sleep well every day, right? So when I talk to patients, I just offer them the option. We could try taking it for 14 days out of the month, or you could just try taking it every day. And then I have patients come back in a few months and just see how things are going with their cycles, with their sleep, and with their symptoms. So that's a really easy thing to do. So progesterone replacement. We definitely do not want to give estrogen to patients who are perimenopausal because remember you're already estrogen dominant. So giving you more estrogen would not be a good idea unless we're doing a low dose birth control pill. And remember that's different because that shuts down your own body's estrogen production. But we definitely don't want to give you additional estrogen when you're perimenopausal. But we do want to give you progesterone and then often testosterone. So there's some really cool things about testosterone that we already know <laughs> it improves sex drive in most patients. It's great for bone density, helps maintain and build muscle. It's good for energy and sleep. We also know now it reduces the risk of breast cancer. So lots of different benefits. And then another cool benefit for this particular period of time is that a little bit of testosterone converts into estrogen. That's a process called aromatization. So when we take testosterone, we get a tiny bit of extra estrogen. Now, we don't want a lot more because remember, you've already got lots of estrogen if you're perimenopausal, but it can give you just a tiny bit that's enough to fill in those low days. Remember some of those really low days? We can have hot flashes and night sweats. In most patients, if you're using testosterone, that tiny bit of extra estrogen will just help fill in those little gaps. And so many patients who choose to take progesterone and testosterone, especially if it's in pellet form, which is my favorite because it's really even, you don't get lots of ups and downs. So if you're getting a testosterone pellet, for example, you're gonna get a little bit of estrogen that hopefully will make those hot flashes go away when you're on your cycle. So that's just a few little caveats and pearls about perimenopause. So don't need any extra estrogen because you're already estrogen dominant. Progesterone can be really helpful either every day or for half of the month, whichever way you prefer. Don't forget to take it at night because it makes you sleepy and that's a great side effect. And then maybe consider adding testosterone as well. So how do we know when we've gone through perimenopause and we're now in the real menopausal state. Well, if you're on birth control pills, it's gonna be really difficult to know because you're getting hormones every day and you're not gonna have symptoms that will tip you off that this is happening. And that's why we usually stop the hormones in the form of birth control at around age 48 to 50, check your hormones and see if it's time to switch to something else. Or if you're not taking birth control pills, if you're doing the progesterone plus or minus testosterone route, 
we just wait and see how your symptoms progress. So if you start having hot flashes for every day instead of just for two or three days a month and you don't have a period, even when you're taking progesterone, not getting a period, I would check your hormones again, and at some point, you're not gonna be estrogen dominant anymore. Your estrogen is gonna to drop to zero and it's gonna stay there. And that's when it's time to start taking estrogen. But every patient is different. And that's why it's so important, I hope, if you have the opportunity to come in and see your menopause specialist when you're perimenopausal or in your even in your early to mid 40s, so that you can be taught what to expect. We can check and see where you are now, try to make some predictions, which are always wrong, but we can try to guess you know, how long you have to go, which is always a guess, but at least give you some structure around what to expect and then have a plan already in mind for what to do when that happens, because it will happen. It happens to everybody. I thought I was the only person who would not go through menopause. <laughs> So I was surprised when it happened to me, but guess what? It happens to all of us. So you do not have to wait a year and suffer with awful symptoms before you get treated. If we know what your baseline is and then we see that it rapidly changes, we can start treating you right away. And if you're really lucky and you're being managed very closely, you could go through this whole thing and not have any symptoms at all. You go directly from taking a low dose birth control pill straight on to using an estrogen testosterone pellet, for example, with no break in between. And so, you know, we could really hypothetically manage this to a point where you can pass through the whole thing feeling pretty good. And wouldn't that be wonderful because we don't get any extra medals for suffering. So that's just a little bit about perimenopause. I look forward to talking to you next week. And if you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I'll see you soon.